I am a well in this great land, looking at its millions of boys and girls to draw from me the inexhaustible divinity and spread his grace everywhere as does the water drawn from a well. This is my story. The story of the son of Jainul Abdin and Ashama. The story of a lad who sold newspapers to help his brother. The story of a pupil reared by Shiva Subramanya Ayer and Ayadure Solomon. The story of a student taught by teachers like Pandale. The story of an engineer spotted by MJK Menon and groomed by the legendary Professor Sarabhai. The story of a scientist tested by failures and setbacks. The story of a leader supported by a large team of brilliant and dedicated professionals. This story will end with me. For I have no belongings in the worldly sense. I have acquired nothing, built nothing, possessed nothing, no family, sons, daughters. I do not wish to set myself up as an example to others. But I believe that a few readers may draw inspiration and come to experience that ultimate satisfaction which can only be found in the life of the Spirit. God's providence is your inheritance. The bloodline of my great-grandfather Aul, my grandfather Pakir, and my father Jainul Abdin may end with Abdul Kalam. But God's grace will never cease, for it is eternal. I was born into a middle-class Tamil family in the island town of Rameshwaram. My father, Jainul Abdin, had neither much formal education nor much wealth. Despite these disadvantages, he possessed great innate wisdom and a true generosity of spirit. He had an ideal helpmate in my mother, Ashim. I was one of many children, a short boy with rather undistinguished looks, born to tall and handsome parents. We lived in our ancestral house, which was built in the middle of the 19th century. It was a fairly large pakka house on the mosque street in Rameshwaram. My austere father used to avoid all inessential comforts and luxuries. However, all necessities were provided for. In fact, I would say mine was a very secure childhood, both materially and emotionally. The famous Shiva temple, which makes Rameshwaram so sacred to pilgrims, was about a 10-minute walk from our house. Our locality was predominantly Muslim, but there were quite a few Hindu families too, living amicably with their Muslim neighbors. There was a very old mosque in our locality where my father would take me for evening prayers. The high priest of the Rameshwaram temple, 
Pakshi Lakshmana Shastri, who was a very close friend of my father's. One of the most vivid memories of my early childhood is of the two men, each in his traditional attire, discussing spiritual matters. My father could convey complex spiritual concepts in very simple down-to-earth Tamil. He once told me, When troubles come, try to understand the relevance of your sufferings. Adversity always presents opportunities for introspection. I have throughout my life tried to emulate my father in my own world of science and technology. I feel convinced that there exists a divine power that can lift one up from confusion, misery, melancholy and failure and guide one to one's true place. I was about six years old when my father embarked on the project of building a wooden sailboat to take pilgrims from Rameshwaram to Dhanushkodi and back. He worked at building the boat on the seashore with the help of a relative, Ahmad Jallaluddin, who later married my sister, Zohra. Ahmad Jallaluddin became a close friend of mine, despite the difference of 15 years in our ages. We used to go for long walks together every evening. As we started from Mosque Street, our first halt would be at the imposing temple of Lord Shiva, where we would circle around the temple with the same reverence as any other pilgrim. Jalaluddin's schooling had been limited, principally because of his family's straitened circumstances. At the time I speak of, he was the only person on the entire island who could write English. He wrote letters for almost anybody in need. Jalaluddin always spoke to me about educated people, of scientific discoveries, of contemporary literature, and of the achievements of medical science. Another person who greatly influenced my childhood was my first cousin, Shamsuddin. He was the sole distributor for newspapers in Rameshwaram and a one-man operation. The newspapers would arrive at Rameshwaram station by the morning train. The Second World War broke out in 1939 when I was eight years old. Soon India was forced to join the Allied forces and something like a state of emergency was declared. The first casualty came in the form of the suspension of the train halt at Rameshwaram station. The newspapers now had to be bundled and thrown out from the moving train on the Rameshwaram road between Rameshwaram and Dhanushkodi. That forced Shamsuddin to look for a helping hand to catch the bundles and, as if naturally, I filled the slot. Shamsuddin helped me earn my first wages. Every child is born with some inherited characteristics into a specific socio-economic and emotional environment and trained in certain ways by figures of authority. I inherited honesty and self-discipline from my father. From my mother, I inherited faith in goodness and deep kindness. But it was the time I spent with Jalaluddin and Shamsuddin that perhaps contributed most to the uniqueness of my childhood and made all the difference in my later life. Magar, you are true and be a bayatu mundi. 
Then the war was over and India's freedom was imminent. I asked my father's permission to leave Rameshwaram and study at the district headquarters in Ramanadapuram. Shamsuddin and Ahmad Jalaluddin travelled with me to Ramanadapuram to enrol me in Schwartz High School. Somehow, I did not take to the new setting. The town of Ramanadapuram was a thriving, factious town of some 50,000 people. But the coherence and harmony of Rameshwaram was absent. I missed my home and grabbed every opportunity to visit Rameshwaram. Once I settled down at Schwartz High School, the enthusiastic 15-year-old within me re-emerged. My teacher, Ayadurai Solomon, was an ideal guide for an eager young mind that was yet uncertain of the possibilities and alternatives that lay before it. During my stay at Ramanadapuram, my relationship with him grew beyond that of teacher and pupil. Ayyadurai Solomon used to say, To succeed in life and achieve results, you must understand and master three mighty forces. Desire, belief and expectation. Ayyadurai Solomon, who later became a reverend, taught me that before anything I wanted could happen, I had to desire it intensely and be absolutely certain it would happen. To take an example from my own life, I had been fascinated by the mysteries of the sky and the flight of birds from early childhood. I used to watch cranes and seagulls soar into flight and long to fly. Simple provincial boy though I was, I was convinced that one day I too would soar up into the skies. Indeed, I was the first child from Rameshwaram to fly. By the time I completed my education at Schwartz, I was a self-confident boy determined to succeed. The decision to go in for further education was taken without a second thought. In 1950, I arrived at St. Joseph's College, Trichy, to study for the intermediate examination. When I later joined the BSc degree course at St. Joseph's, I was unaware of any other option for higher education nor did I have any information about career opportunities available to a student of science. Only after obtaining a BSc did I realize that physics was, was not my subject. I had to go into engineering to realize my dreams. I wonder why some people tend to see science as something which takes man away from God. For me, science has always been the path to spiritual enrichment and self-realization. I managed to be on the list of selected candidates to Madras Institute of Technology, MIT, but admission to this prestigious institution was an expensive affair. Around a thousand rupees was required and my father could not spare that much money. My sister, Zohra, Mott gauged her gold bangles and chain to settle my fee. I was deeply touched by her determination to see me educated and by her faith in my abilities. What fascinated me most at MIT was the sight of two decommissioned aircrafts displayed there. I felt a strange attraction towards them and would sit near them long after other students had gone back to the hostel. After completing my first year, when I had to opt for a specific branch, I almost spontaneously chose aeronautical engineering. In the course of my education at MIT, three teachers shaped my thinking. Professor Sponder, Professor K. A. V. Pandale, and Professor Narsingh Rao. Professor Sponder taught me technical aerodynamics. I consulted him before opting for aeronautical engineering. He told me that one should never worry about one's future prospects. Instead, 
it was more important to lay sound foundations, to have sufficient enthusiasm and an accompanying passion for one's chosen field of study. I myself would like to tell all novitiate engineering students that when they choose their specialization, the essential point is to consider whether the choice articulates their inner feelings and aspirations. Professor K. A. V. Pandalai taught me aerostructure design and analysis. He was a cheerful, friendly and enthusiastic teacher who brought a fresh approach to every year's teaching course. Professor Narsingh Rao was a mathematician who taught us theoretical aerodynamics. After attending his classes, I began to prefer mathematical physics to any other subject. Hari Hari Naam Chittara Chittara Sadha Sanghi Hari Hari Naam Chittara Sahajiyanandu Hovedinu Rati Ankuru Bhalo From MIT, I went to Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, HAL, at Bangalore as a trainee. Two alternative opportunities for employment, both close to my long-standing dream of flying, presented themselves before me when I came out of HAL as a graduate aeronautical engineer. One was a career in the Air Force and another was a job at the Directorate of Technical Development and Production at the Ministry of Defence. I applied for both. The interview calls arrived from both the places, almost simultaneously. I was asked to reach Dehradun by the Air Force Recruitment Authorities and Delhi by DTD and P. My destination was more than 2,000 kilometers away and was to be my first encounter with the vastness of my motherland. Through the window of the compartment, I watched the countryside slip past. It is astonishing how the landscape changes as one moves northwards. I halted for a week in Delhi and appeared for the interview at DTDNP. I did well at the interview. Then I proceeded to Dehradun for my interview at the Air Force Selection Board. I could only finish ninth in the batch of 25. I was deeply disappointed and it took me some time to comprehend that the opportunity to join the Air Force had just slipped through my fingers. I trekked down to Rishikesh with the knowledge that the days ahead would be difficult. I bathed in the Ganga and walked to the Shivananda Ashram, situated a little way up the hill. I met Swami Shivananda, a man who looked like a Buddha, 
wearing a snow white dhoti and wooden slippers i was struck by his irresistible almost childlike smile and gracious manner i told him about my unsuccessful attempt to join the indian air force and my long cherished desire to fly he smiled and said desire when it stems from the heart and spirit when it is pure and intense possesses awesome electromagnetic energy this energy is released into the ether each night as the mind falls into the sleep state each morning it returns to the conscious state reinforced with the cosmic currents that which has been imaged will surely and certainly be manifested you can rely young man upon this ageless promise as surely as you can rely upon the eternally unbroken promise of sunrise and of spring i returned to delhi and inquired at the dtdp about the outcome of my interview in response i was handed my appointment letter i joined the next day as senior scientific assistant on a basic salary of rupees 250 per month 3 years passed then the aeronautical development establishment ade was born in bangalore and i was posted to the new establishment bangalore as a city was in direct contrast to kanpur where i had been posted during my first year at the directorate in fact i feel our country has an uncanny way of bringing out extremes in her people i suppose it is because indians have been both afflicted and enriched by centuries of migrations loyalty to different rulers has dulled our capacity for a single allegiance instead we have developed an extraordinary ability to be compassionate and cruel sensitive and callous deep and fickle all at the same time to the untrained eye we may appear colorful and picturesque to the critical eye we are but shoddy imitations of our various masters in kanpur i saw pan chewing imitations of wajid ali shah and in bangalore it was replaced by dog walking sahibs in bangalore too i longed for the depth and calmness of rameshwaram The workload at ADE during the first year was quite light. A project team was formed to design and develop an indigenous hovercraft prototype in 3 years. The hovercraft completed ahead of schedule was christened Nandi after the bull ridden by Lord Shiva. For a prototype the form fit and finesse was beyond our expectations. However to my great disappointment the project became mired in controversies and had to be shelved professor m g k menon director of the tata institute of fundamental research paid us a surprise visit one day asking me several questions about nandi he requested a 10 minute ride in the hovercraft with me a week later i got a call from incospa the indian committee for space research i went to bombay to attend the interview for the post of a rocket engineer i was interviewed by dr vikram sarabhai along with professor m g k menon and mr saraf then the deputy secretary of the atomic energy commission i was almost immediately struck by dr sarabhai's warmth the next evening i was told about my selection I was to be absorbed as a rocket engineer at Incospa. Sometime in the latter half of 1962, Incospa took the decision to set up the Equatorial Rocket Launching Station at Thumba, a sleepy fishing village near Trivandrum in Kerala. This was the quiet beginning of modern rocket-based research in India. Very soon after this I was asked to proceed to America for a 6 month training program on sounding rocket launching techniques 
at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. I took some time off before going abroad and went to Rameshwaram. My father was very pleased with this opportunity that had come my way. He took me to the mosque and organized a special namaz in thanksgiving. I started my work at NASA at the Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Later, I went to the Goddard Space Flight Center at Greenbelt, Maryland. My impression of the American people can be summarized by a quotation from Benjamin Franklin. Those things that hurt, instruct. I realized that people in this part of the world meet their problems head on. What makes life in Indian organizations difficult is the widespread prevalence of contemptuous pride. It stops us from listening to our juniors, subordinates and people down the line. You cannot expect a person to deliver results if you humiliate him, nor can you expect him to be creative if you abuse him or despise him. The line between firmness and harshness, between strong leadership and bullying, between discipline and vindictiveness is very fine but it has to be drawn. On the 21st of November 1963, soon after my return from NASA, India's first rocket launch took place. It was a sounding rocket called Nike Apache, made at NASA. After the successful launch of Nike Apache, Professor Sarabhai chose to share with us his dream of an Indian satellite launch vehicle. The development of Indian rockets in the 20th century can be seen as a revival of the 18th century dream of Tipu Sultan. When Tipu Sultan was killed, the British captured more than 700 rockets and subsystems of 900 rockets in the Battle of Tirukkannalli in 1799. His army had 27 brigades called Kushuns and each brigade had a company of rocketmen called Jurks. These rockets had been taken to England by William Congreve and were subjected by the British to what we call reverse engineering today. With the death of Tipu, Indian rocketry also met its demise, at least for 150 years. Rocketry was reborn in India thanks to the technological vision of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. Professor Sarabhai took the challenge of giving physical dimensions to this dream. Very many individuals with myopic vision questioned the relevance of space activities in a newly independent nation which was finding it difficult to feed its population. But neither Prime Minister Nehru nor Professor Sarabhai had any ambiguity of purpose. Their vision was very clear. If Indians were to play a meaningful role in the community of nations, they must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to their real life problems. They had no intention of using it merely as a means to display our might. Slowly but surely, 
two Indian rockets were born at Thumba. They were christened Rohini and Menaka. The following year, Professor Sarabhai wanted to see me urgently in Delhi. At the meeting, I was introduced to Group Captain V.S. Narayanan from Air Headquarters. Professor Sarabhai unfolded his plan of developing RATO, Rocket Assisted Takeoff System, for military aircraft. By that evening, the news was out. India was taking up indigenous development of a device to help short run takeoffs by high performance military aircraft. And I was to head the project. I was filled with many emotions happiness, gratitude, a sense of fulfillment. And these lines from a little known poet of the 19th century crossed my mind. For all your days prepare and meet them ever alike. When you are the anvil, bear. When you are the hammer, strike. Two significant developments occurred during the work on RATO. The first was the release of a 10-year profile for space research in the country prepared by Professor Sarabhai. To me, it was the romantic manifesto of a person deeply in love with the space research program in his country. The second development was the formation of a missile panel in the Ministry of Defense. Both Narayanan and I were inducted as members. The future satellite launch vehicle, SLV, had also been conceived by this time. Professor Sarabhai had already handpicked a team to give form to his dream of an Indian SLV. I consider myself fortunate to have been chosen to be the project leader. Professor Sarabhai gave me the additional responsibility of designing the fourth stage of the SLV. It was my usual practice to brief Professor Sarabhai after every missile panel meeting. After attending one such meeting in Delhi, on the 30th of December 1971, I was returning to Trivandrum. Professor Sarabhai was visiting Tumba that very day to review the SLV design. I spoke to him on the telephone from the airport lounge about the salient points that had emerged at the panel meeting. He instructed me to wait at the Trivandrum airport and to meet him there. When I reached Trivandrum, a pall of gloom hung in the air. I was informed that Professor Sarabhai was no more. He had passed away a few hours ago following a cardiac arrest. I was shocked to the core. It had happened within an hour of our conversation. It was a great blow to me. I consider Professor Sarabhai as the Mahatma Gandhi of Indian science, generating leadership qualities in his team and inspiring them through both ideas and examples.
After an interim arrangement with Professor M.G.K. Menon at the helm, Professor Satish Dhawan was given the responsibility of heading the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. The whole complex at Tumba was merged together to form an integrated space center and christened the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, VSSC, as a tribute to the man to whom it owed its existence. The renowned metallurgist, Dr. Brahm Prakash, took over as its first director. Anyone who has taken up the responsibility to lead a team can be successful only if he is sufficiently independent, powerful and influential in his own right to become a person to reckon with. This is perhaps also the path to individual satisfaction in life, for freedom with responsibility is the only sound basis for personal happiness. What can one do to strengthen personal freedom? I would like to share with you two techniques I adopt in this regard. First, by building your own education and skills. Knowledge is a tangible asset, quite often the most important tool in your work. The more up-to-date the knowledge you possess, the freer you are. Knowledge cannot be taken away from anyone except by obsolescence. A leader can only be free to lead his team if he keeps abreast of all that is happening around him in real time. To be a successful team leader, one has to stay back after the din and clutter of a working day to emerge better equipped and ready to face a new day. The second way is to develop a passion for personal responsibility. The sovereign way to personal freedom is to help determine the forces that determine you. Work for the things you believe in. If you do not, you are surrendering your fate to others. The first three years of the SLV project was the period for the revelation of many fascinating mysteries of science. Gradually, I became aware of the difference between science and technology, between research and development. Science is inherently open-ended and exploratory. Development is a closed loop. Mistakes are imperative in development and are made every day. But each mistake is used for modification, upgradation or betterment. Like any other act of creation, the creation of the SLV-3 also had its painful moments. One day, when my team and I were totally engrossed in our work, the news of a death in the family reached me. My brother-in-law and mentor, Janab Ahmad Jalaluddin, was no more. For a couple of minutes, I was immobilized. When I could focus on my surroundings once more, I realized that with Jalaluddin, a part of me had passed away. Travelling overnight in a combination of district buses, I reached Rameshwaram only the next day. I had no words for Zohra or for my niece Mehboob, both of whom were crying uncontrollably. I had no tears to shed. For many days back in Tumba, I felt a sense of futility I had never known before about everything I was doing. I had long talks with Professor Dhawan. He told me that my progress on the SLV project would bring me solace. The confusion would first lessen and would later pass away altogether. In 1976, my father, Jainul Abdin, who had lived on Rameshwaram Island for 102 years, passed away leaving behind 15 grandchildren and one great-grandson. In worldly terms, it was the death of just another old man. No public mourning was organized. No flags were lowered to half-mast. No newspaper carried an obituary for him. He was not a politician, a scholar or a businessman. He was a plain and transparent man. His life inspired the growth 
of all that was benign and angelic, wise and noble. I sat for a long time with my mother, but could not speak. She blessed me in a choked voice when I took leave of her to return to Tumba. The SLV-3 Apogee rocket, scheduled to be flight tested in France, was mired with problems. I had to rush to France to sort them out. Before I could depart, I was informed that my mother had passed away. With three deaths in the family, I needed total commitment to my work in order to keep performing. The desire to work at optimum capacity leaves hardly any room for anything else. With this total commitment and single-mindedness, the SLV-3 dream was finally realized in the middle of 1979. We had scheduled the first experimental flight trial of SLV-3 for the 10th of August 1979. The 23-meter-long four-stage SLV rocket, weighing 17 tons, took off elegantly at 7.58 hours. Stage one performed to perfection. There was a smooth transition from this stage to the second stage. We were spellbound to see our hopes flying in the form of SLV-3. Suddenly, the spell was broken. The second stage went out of control. The flight was terminated after 317 seconds and the vehicle's remains, including my favorite fourth stage with the payload, splashed into the sea. 560 kilometers off Sri Harikota. The incident caused us profound disappointment. I felt a strange mix of anger and frustration. Completely drained, mentally as well as physically, I went straight to my room and slumped onto the bed. A gentle touch on my shoulder woke me up. It was late in the afternoon, almost approaching evening. I saw Dr. Brahm Prakash sitting by my bedside. I was deeply touched by his affection and concern. I was sad, but not alone. A post-flight review established that the mishap occurred because of the failure of the second stage control system. Everybody was convinced by the technical cause and effect sequence presented and there was a general feeling of satisfaction about the whole exercise of failure management measures taken. I was still unconvinced though and felt restless. On the spur of the moment, I stood up and addressed Professor Dhawan. Sir, even though my friends have technically justified the failure, I take the responsibility for judging the RFNA leak detected during the final phase of countdown as insignificant. As a mission director, I therefore take responsibility for the SLV-3 failure. The pursuit of science is a combination of great elation and great despair. I went over many such episodes in my mind. The idea that a man could land on the moon, developed by a Russian mathematician, was realized after nearly four decades and by the United States at that. Professor Chandrasekhar had to wait nearly 50 years before receiving the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the Chandrasekhar limit, 
a discovery made while he was a graduate student at Cambridge in the 1930s. How many failures must Von Braun have gone through before his Saturn launch vehicle put man on the moon? To live only for some unknown future is superficial. It's like climbing a mountain to reach the peak without experiencing its sights. The sides of the mountain sustain life, not the peak. This is where things grow, experience is gained and technologies are mastered. The importance of the peak lies only in the fact that it defines the sights. I went in little steps, just one step after another, but each step towards the top. On the 17th of July 1980, 30 hours before the launch of the second SLV-3, the newspapers were filled with all kinds of predictions. Many reports preferred to trace the history of the first SLV-3 flight and recalled how the third stage had failed to ignite because of lack of fuel and the rocket had nosedived into the ocean. Some were a general prognosis of all that ailed our country and related it to the SLV-3. I knew that the next day's launch was going to decide the future of the Indian space program. In fact, to put it simply, the eyes of the whole nation were on us. In the early hours of the next day, the 18th of July, 1980, at 8.03 hours to be precise, India's first satellite launch vehicle SLV-3 lifted off. I saw the computer displaying data about stage 4 giving the required velocity to the Rohini satellite to enter its orbit. Within the next two minutes, Rohini was set into motion in a low Earth orbit. I spoke in the midst of screeching decibels, the most important words I have ever uttered in my life. Mission Director calling all stations. Stand by for an important announcement. All stages perform to mission requirements. The fourth stage Apogee motor has given the required velocity to put Rohini satellite into orbit. There were happy cries everywhere. When I came out of the blockhouse, I was lifted onto the shoulders of my jubilant colleagues and carried in a procession. The whole nation was excited. India had made its entry into the small group of nations which possessed satellite launch capability. It was both the culmination of a national dream and the beginning of a very important phase in our nation's history. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi cabled her congratulations. But the most important reaction was that of the Indian scientific community. Everybody was proud of this 100% indigenous effort. I experienced mixed feelings. I was happy to achieve the success which had been evading me for the past two decades. But I was sad because the people who had inspired me were no longer there to share my joy. My father, my brother-in-law Jalaluddin and Professor Sarabhai. The credit for the successful SLV-3 flight goes first to the giants of the Indian space program, Professor Sarabhai in particular, who had preceded this effort. Next, to the hundreds of VSSC personnel who had through sheer willpower proved the metal of our countrymen and also, not least, to Professor Dhawan and Dr. Brahm Prakash who had led the project. Within a month of the SLV-3 success, I received a call from Professor Dhawan in Delhi asking me to join him the next morning to meet the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. I had a small problem. It had to do with my clothes. I was dressed casually as is my wont and wearing slippers. 
not by any standards of etiquette, suitable attire in which to meet the Prime Minister. When I told Professor Dhawan about this problem, he told me not to worry about my dress. You are beautifully clothed in your success, he quipped. Professor Dhawan and I arrived at the Parliament House Annex the next morning. There were about 30 members of the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha in the room. Professor M.G.K. Menon and Dr. Nag Chaudhary were also present. Srimati Gandhi spoke to the members about the success of the SLV-3 and lauded our achievement. In January 1981, the renowned nuclear scientist, Professor Raja Ramana, invited me for a private meeting. The Devil Missile Program had been shelved in spite of tremendous achievements made by Narayanan and his team at the Defence Research and Development Laboratory, DRDL. The entire program of military rockets was reeling under a persistent apathy. Professor Ramana asked me if I would like to join DRDL and shoulder the responsibility of shaping their guided missile development program. I felt honoured by the esteem in which Professor Ramana held me. Republic Day 1981 brought with it a pleasant surprise, the conferment of the Padma Bhushan Award on me. I filled my room with the music of Bismillah Khan's Shanai. The music took me to another time, another place. I visited Rameshwaram and hugged my mother. My father ran his caring fingers through my hair. My mentor, Jalaluddin, announced the news to the crowd gathered on Mosque Street. My sister, Sora, prepared special sweets for me. Pakshi Lakshmana Shastri put a tilak on my forehead. Father Solomon blessed me holding the Holy Cross. I saw Professor Sarabhai smiling with a sense of achievement. The sapling which he had planted 20 years ago had finally grown into a tree whose fruits were being appreciated by the people of India. गर्भाचे आवडी मातेचा डोहळा तेथीचा जीवळा तेथे बिंबे गर्भाचे आवडी मातेचा डोहळा तेथीचा जीवळा तेथे बिंबे तू का म्हणे तैसा अनुभव सरीसा मुखाला आनंदाचे डोई आनंद तरंग आनंदची अंग आनंदाचे आनंदाचे डोई आनंद तरंग I joined DRDL on the 1st of June 1982. To the horror of many old-timers, I started inviting people from the Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institutes of Technology, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and many other educational institutions where related experts could be found. I felt that the stuffy work centers of DRDL 
needed a breath of fresh air. I made a presentation in the South Block. Although some questioned our ambitious proposal, everyone was excited about the idea of India having her own missile systems. When the Defence Minister, R. Venkatraman, suggested that we launch an integrated guided missile program instead of making missiles in phases, we could not believe our ears. The proposal of the missile development project had been turned overnight into the blueprint of an integrated program with far-reaching consequences. When I presented the government sanction letter before the Missile Technology Committee at DRDL, they were enthused with fire and action. The proposed projects were christened in accordance with the spirit of India's self-reliance. Thus, the surface-to-surface -surface weapon system became Prutvi, the Earth. The tactical core vehicle was called Trishul, the trident of Lord Shiva. The surface-to-air defense system was named Akash, the sky. And the anti-tank missile project, Nark, Cobra. I gave the name Agni, fire, to my long-cherished dream of REX, re-entry experiment launch vehicle. Dr. Arunachalam came to DRDL and formally launched the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program on the 27th of July, 1983. It was a great event in which every single employee of DRDL participated. Everybody who was somebody in Indian Aerospace Research was invited. This was the second most significant day in my career, next only to the 18th of July, 1980, when the SLV-3 had launched Rohini into the Earth's orbit. The launch of the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program was like a bright flash on the Indian scientific firmament. Missile technology had been considered the domain of a few selected nations in the world. People were curious to see how we were going to achieve all that was promised. We were at a meeting laying down the targets for 1984 when news came of Dr. Brahm Prakash's death on the evening of the 3rd of January at Bombay. It was a great emotional loss for me. His compassion and humility were exemplary. His healing touch on the day of the failed SLV E1 flight surfaced in my memory serving to deepen my sorrow. If Professor Sarabhai was the creator of VSSC, Dr. Brahm Prakash was the executor. He had nurtured the institution when it most needed nourishment. His humility mellowed me and helped me discard my aggressive approach. His humility did not consist merely in being modest about his talents or virtues, but in respecting the dignity of all those who worked under him and in recognizing the fact that no one is infallible, not even the leader. He was an intellectual giant with a frail constitution. He had a childlike innocence and I always considered him a saint among scientists. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi expressed her desire to personally apprise herself of the progress of the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program. The entire organization was filled with an aura of excitement. On the 19th of July, 1984, Srimati Gandhi visited DRDL. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was a person with a tremendous sense of pride in herself, in her work and in her country. The esteem in which she held our work in the field of guided missiles boosted our morale immensely. We were working on the action plan that had emerged from the earlier month's review 
when the news of Srimati Gandhi's assassination broke. Srimati Gandhi's death was a tremendous loss to the scientific community. She had given impetus to scientific research in the country. Her son Rajiv Gandhi took over as the new Prime Minister of India. He went to the polls and obtained a mandate from the people to carry forward the policies of Mrs. Gandhi, the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program being a part of them. Work on Prithvi was nearing completion when we entered 1988. Prithvi was launched at 11.23 hours on the 25th of February. It was an epoch-making event in the history of rocketry in the country. Prithvi was not merely a surface-to-surface -surface missile. It was, in fact, the basic module for all future guided missiles in the country. The launch of Prithvi sent shockwaves across the unfriendly neighboring countries. The response of the Western Bloc was initially one of shock and then of anger. A seven-nation technology embargo was clamped making it impossible for India to buy anything even remotely connected with the development of guided missiles. The emergence of India as a self-reliant country in the field of guided missiles upset all the developed nations of the world. The Agni team was comprised of more than 500 scientists. Many organizations were networked to undertake this huge effort of launching Agni. The Agni launch had been scheduled for the 20th of April 1989. This was going to be an unprecedented exercise. Unlike space launch vehicles, a missile launch involves wide-ranging safety hazards. All activities preparatory to the launch went according to schedule. We had decided to move the people living in nearby villages to safety at the time of the launch. This attracted media attention and led to much controversy. By the time the 20th of April 1989 arrived, the whole nation was watching us. Foreign pressure was exerted through diplomatic channels to abort the flight trial. But the Indian government stood behind us like a rock and staved off any distraction to our work. We were at T14 seconds when the computer signaled hold, indicating that one of the instruments was functioning erratically. This was immediately rectified. Meanwhile, the downrange station asked for a hold. In another few seconds, multiple holds were necessitated and this resulted in irreversible internal power consumption. We had to abort the launch. The missile had to be opened up to replace the onboard power supplies. The press was up in arms and fielded various interpretations of the postponement of the flight to suit the fancies of their readership. Cartoonist Sudhir Dar sketched a shopkeeper returning a product to the salesman, saying that like Agni, it would not take off. Another cartoonist showed one Agni scientist explaining that the launch was postponed because the press button did not make contact. The Hindustan Times showed a leader consoling press reporters. There is no need for any alarm. It's a purely peaceful, non-violent missile. After a detailed analysis conducted virtually round the clock for the next 10 days, our scientists had the missile ready for launch on the 1st of May. 1989. But again, during the automatic computer checkout period at T10 seconds, a hold signal was indicated. A closer inspection showed that one of the control components, S1 TVC, was not working according to the mission requirements. The launch had to be postponed yet again. Now such things are very common in rocketry and quite often happen in other countries too. But the expectant nation was in no mood to appreciate our difficulties. 
the Hindu carried a cartoon by Keshav, showing a villager counting some currency notes and commenting to another, Yes, it's the compensation for moving away from a hut near the test site. A few more postponements and I can build a house of my own. Another cartoonist designated Agni as IDBM, Intermittently Delayed Ballistic Missile. Amul's cartoon suggested that what Agni needed was to use their butter as fuel. Detailed analysis of the component failure during the second attempt led to the refurbishment of the control system. Finally, the launch was scheduled for the 22nd of May. The previous night, Dr. Arunachalam, General K. N. Singh and I were walking together with the Defence Minister, K. C. Panth. It was a full moon night. It was high tide and the waves crashed and rolled as if singing of God's glory and power. Would we succeed with the Agni launch tomorrow? This question was foremost in all our minds. Breaking a long silence, the Defence Minister finally asked me, Kalam, what would you like me to do to celebrate the Agni success tomorrow? What did I want? What was it that I did not have? What could make me happier? And then I found the answer. We need a hundred thousand saplings to plant, I said. His face lit up with a friendly glow. You are buying the blessings of Mother Earth for Agni, the Defense Minister quipped. We will succeed tomorrow. The next day, Agni took off at 7.10 hours. It was a perfect launch. The missile followed a textbook trajectory. All flight parameters were met. It was like waking up to a beautiful morning from a nightmarish sleep. We had reached the launch pad after five years of continuous work at multiple work centers. We had lived through the ordeal of a series of snags in the last five weeks. We had survived pressure from everywhere to stop the whole thing. But we had done it at last. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. A mere 600 seconds of elegant flight washed off our entire fatigue in an instant. What a wonderful culmination of our years of labor. I wrote in my diary that night, Do not look at Agni as an entity directed upward to deter the ominous or exhibit your might. It is fire in the heart of an Indian. Do not even give it the form of a missile as it clings to the burning pride of this nation and thus is bright. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi called the Agni launch a major achievement in our continuing efforts to safeguard our independence and security by self-reliant means. The technology demonstration through Agni is a reflection of our commitment to the indigenous development of advanced technologies for the nation's defense. Till the Agni launch, the Indian Armed Forces had been structured for a strictly defensive role to safeguard our nation, to shield our democratic processes from the turbulence in the countries around us and to raise the cost of any external intervention to an unacceptable level. With Agni, India had reached the stage where she had the option of preventing wars involving her.
On Republic Day 1990, the nation celebrated the success of its missile program. I was conferred the Padma Vibhushan along with Dr. Arunachalam. Memories of the Padma Bhushan awarded a decade ago came alive. I still lived more or less as I had lived then, in a room 10 feet wide and 12 feet long, furnished mainly with books, papers and a few pieces of hired furniture. The only difference was at that time my room was in Trivandrum and now it was in Hyderabad. The mess bearer brought me my breakfast of idlis and buttermilk and smiled in silent congratulation for the award. I was touched by the recognition bestowed on me by my countrymen. A large number of scientists and engineers leave this country at their first opportunity to earn more money abroad. It is true that they definitely get greater monetary benefits. But could anything compensate for this love and respect from one's own countrymen? On the 15th of October, 1991, I turned 60. I looked forward to retirement and planned to open a school for the less privileged children. It was during this period that I decided to put down my memoirs and express my observations and opinions on certain issues. The biggest problem Indian youth faced, I felt, was a lack of clarity of vision, a lack of direction. It was then that I decided to write about the circumstances and people who made me what I am today. The idea was not merely to pay tribute to some individuals or highlight certain aspects of my life. What I wanted to say was that no one, however poor, underprivileged or small, need feel disheartened about life. Problems are a part of life. Suffering is the essence of success. As someone said, God has not promised, sky is always blue. Flower strewn pathways all our life through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. I will not be presumptuous enough to say that my life can be a role model for anybody. But some poor child living in an obscure place, in an underprivileged social setting, may find a little solace in the way my destiny has been shaped. It could perhaps help such children liberate themselves from the bondage of their illusory backwardness and hopelessness. Irrespective of where they are right now, they should be aware that God is with them. And when He is with them, who can be against them? Let the latent fire in the heart of every Indian acquire wings and the glory of this great country light up the sky. Mm -hmm.